Welcome to this TSBWG virtual interim meeting, uh, specifically on L4S today. And uh, we'll show the IETF note well, which applies to this meeting. Uh, please read and uh, understand it. Uh, so we're using WebEx today, which is a little bit different uh, than the, the uh, Meet Echo that we normally use for working group meetings. Um, the uh, understanding I have is that Meet Echo will be available for future virtual interims, but wasn't set up in time for this one. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Uh, hoping we can uh, use the Etherpad for uh, Blue Sheets, and uh, also we could keep minutes there. Uh, so. Uh, please record your names at the top of that uh, Etherpad link, uh, like we typically would on the written blue sheets. And then uh, to uh, keep the WebEx chat from um, getting too active and us losing track of who wants to uh, be in the mic line, since we don't have that feature of the uh, uh, Meet Echo tool. Um, hoping people will use the WebEx chat mainly to uh, draw attention to uh, when they want to uh, be put in the mic queue and uh, also to respond to polls that we might uh, ask. Uh, so, uh, and if you could keep a response to like support or not support, that would be ideal, I think, because it's most clear uh, rather than us trying to parse sentences. Um, Otherwise, there is the normal TSPWG Jabber room set up, and uh, I think Gori is planning to monitor that during the meeting for uh, anything that, that comes up that you want channeled for some reason, uh, if you're unable to speak yourself. Are these uh, things all clear? Any other changes we should make? Okay, good. So the agenda today, uh, we really set this up um, primarily to, uh, to to work through the two main open uh, uh, big questions that uh, we as chairs thought still were existing around the L4S uh, topic. And uh, we were hoping to uh, work towards uh, some conclusion to these things uh, and understand the working group consensus if there is one uh, around uh, first, whether there's uh, sufficient uh, description of the transport requirements uh, to use the L4S ID such that uh, the working group is comfortable that uh, different implementations could be done for uh, multiple protocols and, uh, and there's no uh, concerns that these are impossible to implement or unclear in some way. Uh, so I'm hoping Bob, uh, or actually Cohn, will give a, a update on what's going on with that draft recently, but hopefully be fairly brief, and then we'll go straight to an open discussion on uh, issues or questions people have on these things. Uh, and if that doesn't take the full 40 minutes, that's fine. Um, and then we'll move to the uh, L4S Ops draft. Greg will give us the status in the same way quickly, and then we'll have time for open discussion. Um, and then we'll try to wrap up at the end, maybe uh, starting some consensus calls if that looks like uh, it makes sense to do. Uh, so the main goal of the meeting, I uh, wanted to set this up so that we had ample time to discuss the topics. Uh, I think in the last uh, couple of IETF meetings, we've run short of time for discussion on these things. Um, we've mainly had the meeting time for status updates and then had to quickly uh, either move on or adjourn and haven't uh, maybe drove some of the, the discussion to conclusion. Uh, and uh, depending on how things look, I think we're hoping to start consensus calls to make sure that uh, we're understanding the group's feelings on these things uh, by the end of the meeting. Uh, and those would, of course, carry over to the mailing list. Uh, so uh, as usual. What we'd like to keep the scope of this meeting to is the, the two big open questions we have about uh, finalization of state of the transport requirements 
and uh, whether the guidelines draft is sufficient for safe experimentation with uh, L4S on, uh, on networks that include parts of the internet. Um, we don't want to uh, spend a lot of meeting time talking about alternatives to L4S design or significant uh, changes that would uh, that would lead us on to tangents. Uh, we like to keep with the established support we had in the past for the use of ECT1 as the identifier. Specifically, that's what I mean by uh, uh, by not spending a lot of time on alternatives. Is uh, I don't think we should be uh, spending time on conversation that deviates from use of ECT1 as the L4S identifier. And uh, that's. That's it. If all of that is clear, I'd like to hand it over to, uh, I guess, Cone for a uh, discussion of the uh, L4S ID requirements. Yep. Can you hear me? Very, very low. Low. Okay. Yeah. Any better now? Sure. I'm a little bit I... better. Now I can increase this. Share the PowerPoint. It's definitely better. Come on, thank you. Is better the sound? Yes, you're coming okay. through now. Okay. The screen is coming through as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, then we can go. Um, so I think uh, there has been a lot of activity, good discussions in progress on the on the L4S ID draft. Um, so we had the Prague requirement survey. Um, so target, targeting congestion control developers, uh, looking at feasibility, realizability, and to see whether there is a broad support. So we had a lot of uh, uh, both uh, responses and discussions based on the responses. Uh, we also had uh, the chair's detailed review and, and also uh, 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 a lot of list discussions and recommendations. Um, so we focused, because there was a lot of work, we focused mainly on the normative text. Um, there are still a lot of editor editorials to do as well. So there is now a, a 16 draft, a, a version 16, that Bob just uh, recently um, released. Uh, so So... It's still not finished, let's say, but uh, we, we focused on, on mainly the normative text. So I think it, it resulted definitely already in a clearer and more to the point set of requirements. Um, yeah, the, maybe short about the, the requirement survey, we had a new uh, one from Apple, uh, Vidi uh, shared that, thanks to that. Um, so uh, I updated the the, the web page, uh, added it to it, and and also the consolidated version is updated, so you can have a look at it. Um, the main the main contribution, let's say, uh, it was it was mostly in line uh, Apple's comments. Uh, the main uh, let's say new thing that popped up was uh, an objection on uh, should detect loss in counting of time based units. Um, so that is updated now based on that uh, of Apple's and Google's feedback. Um, so the objection was that um, the time-based uh, is maybe not the only or the sufficient way uh, to allow scalable reordering. Um, so also it might be better to express again the requirement, not the mechanism, so to allow alternative implementations and, and potentially more robust implementations. And also, so feedback from Google, Neil mentioned, okay, uh, Rack is actually doing already uh, more than the time-based only. So we came to the conclusion, okay, it should not be time-based only, it should be adaptive interval, and we, we should refer to the, the RFC of Rack. So that's good. Um, so for the rest, uh, a short status, I'm going to go quickly through this. So there were, uh, Objections on the document only requirements. So they are now only, uh, they have been removed and, and replaced by a, a general advice in, in making documentation available uh, if possible. Um, 
so there were clarifications on uh, requested for how to safely coexist with Reno. Um, so, yeah, what does it mean uh, to be safely coexist with Reno congestion control? And we don't want to be as degraded as Reno. Um, so again, uh, be open for innovations and alternative implementations. Um, so again, the mechanism is not important, but the, the results. And so it is, uh, there is consensus to make uh, safely coexist with Reno congestion control to replace that with a classic congestion control such as Reno, because there is an RFC and it's an example uh, as required by, and it seems there is another RFC which describes this uh, more in detail, 5033. So that's uh, the consensus on that discussion. Question. Uh, yeah. Um, where did we wind up on the concern that the repeated mentions of Reno might focus too much attention on it? I think I saw a, at least one reference to Cubic in the new draft, and that was good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, there are two aspects. We we focused also on repeat, uh, uh, replacing TCP. So that it's not only TCP because a lot of people get primed by the idea. Okay, it's only about TCP. So you'll see also uh, this is removed and the Reno we we uh, minimized it. So maybe it's a good remark because for Cubic there is also an RFC, right? Maybe we could add this as well. I don't know, Bob. Did did you? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I to respond to David. Um used Reno as an example. I didn't particularly want to keep adding Cubic. I know um, obviously Cubic is used a lot, but um, as far as the ITF is concerned, it's informational and, you know, otherwise we'll get the TPM um, people you, you need to refer to the standard. So a list of done in uh, Cubic, you get the list of um, referring to it, I've used classic congestion controls such as you know, as, as, the, as the general way of saying it but it's a bit once if you know okay i Is just want to add i just want to add this is vidi and i just want to add that cubic we are in working on it to make it a proposed standard that should happen by the end of this year likely so would that make a change in the draft if Reno, oh, sorry, if Cubic becomes a proposed standard. So, so depending on the timing, uh, it might indeed be then a possibility to to also include Cubic as with an RFC reference, right? That would be perfect. Yep. That'd be great. I also just took a quick look at the drafts and Cubic is mentioned in the intro right next to Reno, which I think does a good start in, in, in setting the right context. Okay, good. And, and I concur with that, but I also am not sure this is withholding until Cubic is finalized and published. So I, I don't think we need a normative reference to Cubic. We just need to be clear that Cubic is actually exists as, as in the RFC series. Okay. Going further. Um, so there were, there were comments on should scale down to fractional congestion windows. Um, so not everybody was convinced that it is a problem and there were, uh, already implementations that are already in use even, uh, today, uh, that, that covered that problem. Um, so, so today it's a shoot, but I think we should make sure, um, if it occurs on the internet, those that implement, uh, such, uh, uh, reduced back off, they will back off while others are not. So maybe a final call to, to say, should we keep the shoot? Uh, anyway, it's an important output of the experiment. I think whether it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, a, a, a disadvantage for the ones who implement it or, or whether it's a very often occurring problem on the internet or not. Okay. Um, there were also a lot of comments on uh, monitoring fail back and replacement to clarify things. So we have clarified monitoring. Uh, it's uh, both on, on live traffic, unless there is an alternative or external monitoring on the path. Um, 
also clarified adaptation and replacement conditions. Um, also, there was text uh, stating that there is no need to uh, change from ECT1 to ECT0. Um, that is kept if, if it is trans transient because it's important to be able to fall back or to detect at least that you can fall back. Of course, if it's uh, uh, replaced permanently, then there is no need to keep it EC1. It's better to, to line it up with the congestion control that is used. Um, so it's hopefully this text is, is clarified now. Um, and we also align to these requirements with uh, the operational guidelines draft. Um, there is also a, a smaller discussion based on, on reduced RTT bias. Um, so there is mainly the conflict between the must and the as much as possible. Um, I think it's also important to make sure that this RTT bias is meant only for rate conversions. So after a long time, clearly it's not uh, for slow start, for getting up to speed, a reduction on, on a strong marking signal. If the marking signal gives 100% continuously, uh, all of these uh, things are better to scale with the RTT. Uh, to prefer, preserve uh, also stability and efficiency. Um, so, so I think there we, we still can improve the text a bit. Um, there's another discussion whether rate fairness is absolute or more gradual, so that we still say as much as possible or another word compromising between stable throughputs. Uh, for low latency services and optimal uh, uh, using the short periods of, avail of available bandwidth. Uh, also for a low latency flow, is it really important to, to, to quickly uh, vary the, the bandwidth? So, yeah, it, we, we still can discuss and, and maybe fine tune. I think definitely to limit it to rate conversions is important. Um, all the other things might be also an outcome of, of yeah, the experience. I, I don't think there's a, f uh, see, I'm, I'm the other side of the uh, discussion of first folks about must as much as possible. Uh, the short summary of my view is must do X as much as possible is in practice a should. And uh, I don't think there's disagreement about what we want what we want the implementers to do. I think uh, we're having a, and a, a surprisingly long discussion over the precise words to use. And, and Kuhn's point about weight converts, I think, is much more important than whether it's a must or a should. Yeah, that, that's one aspect, of course. Uh, yeah, there, there is this discussion, but also I, I, I also saw people thinking, yeah, but um, if we need to be uh, RTT uh, unbiased, um, okay, th there are a lot of mechanisms that are still RTT dependent and need to be RTT dependent. So, so still, I think it's additionally to the discussion also important to uh, to make sure this applies only to the rate conversions. So, okay. But yeah, something to to further discuss, I guess. Coin, um, this is really again. So, the RTT bias for I think this is a good point. Uh, I don't remember reading this in the draft. Is this updated? Like, not to do it for slow start. I don't know what's the language to use here, but these are good points uh, that you have on the slide. Yeah, indeed. So, so th this is a recent discussion. I don't know, Bob, what is the latest version that you have in the slides, but uh, um, I think it's uh, we kind of agreed that rate conversions is part of the wording here. Um, I didn't check the latest. Uh, 16, maybe offline we can check and, uh, but, but definitely uh, really to, to be discussed on the mailing list in that case. Uh, okay. So there are still uh, requirements that were not changed. Um, so only some minor uh, typos and clarifications, still the same. Um, maybe other topics that are ongoing are about uh, guard DSCPs um, and whether um, yeah, this this can protect. Is is there already a robust scheme detected? On the other hand, I'm I'm also thinking it will kind of defeat the purpose of the experiment, which for me is uh, mainly the adoption level 
which is a success criterion of this these experiments uh, if it's something good that people want to use of course if we we have mechanisms that really stop flexible deployments that might hurt the experiment more than uh, than it will help um, on the other hand um, if there are guards needed or people are unsure about whether their congestion control will um, hurt others there are possibilities maybe even with this to 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 limit the scope of your experiments so well it's there is a discussion ongoing and i'm i'm a bit afraid that uh if it is applied it will lead to uh, a very difficult deployable story um also, there is a recent replay protection interactions discovered. Um, this uh, limit, so, so it seems that um, secure tunnels are limiting uh, the reorder resilience, uh, which can cause when ECT0 is marked to CE in a first bottleneck, and later in a second bottleneck, the CE ends up in the dual queue and gets priority. So there is a actually a, uh, expedited uh, forwarding of the CE mark. But this, uh, with this replay protection in tunnels, can cause uh, packets in the same round trip time to be to be dropped. Um, so, yeah, the, there, there seems to be, uh, so it is a problem, and, and it's a problem only for, for ECT0 users at this stage. Um, the impact is, uh, limited to drops in the same round trip time as i have said so there shouldn't be too much uh, uh, let's say deviation from the normal congestion control um, it seems there are also similar issues with diff surf if, if diff surf is mixed in a single tunnel um, and clearly solutions need to be uh, in making this reorder or reordering resilience with uh, or, or scalable uh so well if windows become bigger and bigger a very small or limited reorder uh, window in these mechanisms uh, is uh, causing more and more problems not only for for this case of course this is a new topic that uh, is probably needs some more discussion um Paul, can you yeah. can we go back a slide yeah, I don't think it's quite as simple as described here. I'm not sure it's a good idea to go dive into this, but uh, in particular, um, I don't think the ECT zero to CE marking is the is is the is, is the is the is the only is the only cause of the problem. Okay. And if I you think have... what happens here, as opposed to diving to this now, which will be a rat hole. Uh, I will take a note to try to go into this on the list, but I don't believe okay. that the summary of the problem space is correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We do discuss further on the list. Thanks. I think uh, Sebastian is in the mic line. Yeah, I don't have a view on that, so please interrupt me. And... Sebastian, would you like to? Give your comment. I think David just said it. I wanted to um, address the replay issue, but if this isn't the right venue to do this, I'm just going to keep quiet on that. Yeah, maybe best to to further discuss on the list then, or maybe in the if it's an important topic to be discussed afterwards. Uh, of course, can be done as well. But uh, to quickly go through the presentation, um, uh, Gory is also in the queue. So Gory, would you uh, like to? Yeah, um, my, my comment was at least this should appear in security considerations. I know from looking at other inter area documents that people talked about the ordering threshold before. So perhaps you could already add it to your security considerations. That's something to think yeah. about. Uh, and then have that discussion that David encouraged. Definitely. Okay, good. Um, another open topic. Um, so there, there is a, a new end of a set of new end of experience requirements added. So and and there is a, a, a discussion topic on what is the preferred um, end of 
uh, experiment treatment of ECT1 packets must they be treated as if they are not ECT or as ECT0 so um, might also be an interesting discussion which we hopefully don't have to turn into reality but okay that, that, to be clear that's in the network not by the host yeah yes so conclusion i think we we have we are making good progress there's a lot of activity and uh, if we uh, continue as we are doing uh, it would be great um, so other inputs are still welcome uh, also for the survey that's that's it from my side there are any other questions I, I I would like to clarify it. So uh, there are some open issues, but is it uh, the correct sense that you think that this is uh, maybe like one revision away from a working group last call, or and you think that's a quick revision, or am I wrong about that? Yes, I think we, if, if the discussion goes like it isn't, we can uh, further, uh, let's say, make decisions on, on the open points soon. Uh, we did already a lot, I think. Um, so I just come in on that. Yeah. There, there are a lot of edits from um, Gori's or Gori's points and, and David's. Um, most of them are non normative now, um, so hopefully. Any discussion on the latest normative changes can go on in parallel to sorting out the editorial stuff. Um, but there, there are some sticky issues left. So, yeah, yes. I was going to ask how, how much of our favorite uh, issue 3168 coexistence hits the normative text in this draft. Well, yeah, I'm ho I mean, there, there is new. Well, there was new normative text in 15. We're now on 16. Um, it's, it's no longer new, but it's still there. Um, and, um, I would love it if a lot of the 40 minutes, um, of discussion was about that and whether it's what is required and all the rest of it, and whether it's consistent with, you know, for S ops draft and so on, because there hasn't been any discussion of that text on the list since I, um, we posted it last week, but there's been a lot of discussion about a lot of other things. Uh, the, the current text is on the screen now. I'm a, I don't know, chairs, how, how, how you want to arrange the meeting. Um, but, uh, uh, Kuhn, have you Kuhn, finished have the presentation you and you're now sort of expecting discussion, expecting or, discussion or, what's or, or what's happening? Yep, I finished the yep, presentation, presentation, so. presentation, so. Yeah, so yeah. I would like so I would like to, oh, some feedback. Some feedback. So I, I would like to sort of open up mic lines and uh, encourage people to share their thoughts on whether this is uh, uh, whether you share uh, what uh, uh, has just been expressed about sort of the maturity of the draft and uh, uh, specifically, I think we were looking for. Uh, a sense of whether people that build transport protocols think this is uh, doable for their transports and uh, and whether the requirements described are all clear enough and uh, and reasonable enough that uh, that L4S transports could be developed based on this document. So with that, Mike Hughes are open and Jonathan is first in line, so I'll let Jonathan go. All right, thank you. So, starting with what's on the screen right now, this uh, business of the detection heuristic, uh, one thing I noticed is that there doesn't seem to be a normative description of how such a detection, detection heuristic should be implemented. Um, there's a description of what it should do and what it should achieve, but not how it works. And I don't believe there's a working 
uh, implementation that we can test to see how effective it is. Yeah, that's that was. Uh, let's say. Right, can I come one, in on one, that? Yeah. What, what, one of the reasons for moving to L4S Ops was because the thing that doesn't work is that it gives too many false positives. In other words, it, it definitely finds or it finds nearly all classic cases. It just sometimes thinks an L4S is a classic case. So um, no, that, that's the base we're starting from. And so we, we, we agreed that it's not something you'd want to be happening automatically because it would be finding false positives, but it's a, it's, it's a start in your monitoring. And then you can do, um, if you're off, off, out of band, off, offline, um, doing your testing, you can then, um, go and check a bit more carefully after that. Right, but you still need a, something to implement. You need, you need an algorithm to implement somehow. Yes, yes. That needs to be a normative in the normative document. Um, I, well, I, I wouldn't say it needs to be a normative. Um, in fact, there's hardly any algorithm, and this has been um, this being discussed off list um, by other people that um, there isn't normative stuff about algorithm in this document and that is that is very deliberate I'm, I'm not talking about the detection i mean just in terms of a congestion control it's not a normative doc document about a congestion control because it's a document about what other congestion control documents and and implementations have to do um yes it would be great if there was just one way of doing this or if there was one perfect way of doing this but there isn't and there's ideas on how to do it different ways. We don't want to stop that. So I'm, I'm not sure that we need to specify an algorithm as, uh, you know, as sort of, you must do this, you must do that, and, and so on. So on. Yeah, and it also it also depends also on, depends on, on what, the, what, the, what the what kind of what AQMs kind are of there AQMs and how they can be detected. Can be detected. Uh, there are a lot of mechanisms, mechanisms that that detect specific implementation, and, and if and there is a certain large amount of, large of amount AQMs, of AQMs which, which can be detected using such, using uh, such uh, heuristics, that heuristics, that would be that an, that would be an uh, option to, to I, do I that still say it can be, can be detected when detected really having the, really having the, the, experience, the experience of the experiments, of the experiments ongoing. ongoing. I still say that there needs to be some algorithm that has been shown to work, at least in lab conditions, um, to use as a reference. The, the language can permit other approaches that are also effective but there needs to be some reference to implement. I don't know. There is a reference implementation. Um, I don't know whether we refer to this, Bob. Um, there is a white yes. paper. Yes. White paper it's referred to in the, referred to in the appendix. In the appendix. Yeah. And there is a, a, as, a as paper, a white paper with... with, with, with the, uh, right, it has a white paper coder, with, with, with source code with source code in the in the uh, there is a an echo which is a bit annoying but so with source code Jonathan, 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 I believe I believe you're the source code. Code. I believe you're the new mute please when you're not speaking um, so, as source code in the L4S uh, Teams Prague repository, um, oh no, um, it's not part of that repository probably bob the, the source code is 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 accessible right and there is a white paper which is uh, even uh, describing a lot of extra ideas uh, that can be used but were not let's say explored by us or only partly right so the the reference codes that we that we've seen does not work not not it's not reliable under lab conditions and the descript these algorithms that we see in the white paper or in source code are not in ietf documents but uh, so so the the code that is available is is parameterizable a lot eh? so there are a lot of parameters that can be tuned 
to detect specific cases and it's it's true it's it's our let's say real world um, um, deployment or, or real world experience that that needs to find out how these can reliably be detected um, and how they can automatically and reliably be detected and that's based on the the algorithm that exists and you say it's not working it, it is working um, and it can be tuned to be very um, at this stage at least uh, very um, um, optimistic or or rather pessimistic um, and probably based on what's a typical deployment it can be further tuned and and refined and all the additional mechanism that we have described could be used so under the same um under the same parameterization it shows both false positives and false negatives that is not a working algorithm no, no hang on it shows extremely few false negatives out of millions of tests extremely few false negatives and i'm sorry if you're worried about that few false negatives on a on an issue that doesn't really you know it, it, everything can still make progress then i'm you know i'm out of here that's just that's just asking too much the number of false negatives are very small also, uh, take in well, mind that, is that this is only yes. an issue when you really have long running flows. Huh? So if you want to be careful, you use the, the algorithm for short flows and, and the impacts. It's, it's like everything uh, today, there is, uh, I mean, as long as there is, least, I think I'm hearing a discussion here that ought to be reflected, re reflected in the draft as opposed to left to left to a white paper that's referenced and particularly the, the uh, um, discussion of, uh, uh, when, when, and how the algorithm need, need, uh, ought to be tuned. Well, I mean, this, they, this I mean, is part of the, the summary in the appendix. The appendix. Oh, <clears throat> um, I would, um, agree with what David said and also just point out that it is not just long running flows that are affected. We have data showing that short flows are also a problem here. What do you mean that, that short flows are affected by? Short flows, short, short flows can be a problem in either direction. Short flows can affect a long running classic flow or conventional flow and a short Conventional flows can be affected by a long running L4S flow. Uh, we have data showing that, and so saying that it's only long running flows is incorrect. Jonathan, long running flows in the internet are affected by short running flows. What the hell do you mean? Of course they're affected. I mean, but, but you can't talk about fairness between a short flow and a long running flow. The, the, the experiments have taken short loads of short flows hitting long running flows and done them with cubic and then replaced them with l4s and shown that they don't make a difference except in one or two very small cases so yes of course flows are affected by other flows but what do you mean there's no unfairness, no issue, unfairness there. issue there we've used a harm metric and i'm sure Pete that is what I we've used as well the harm well, metric, the harm metric. And it's and Pete and, I will, Pete and I will be happy to discuss the detailed data with you. Okay, right. Sorry, I'll, I'll cool down a bit. Yeah, could you please? Because what you're saying at the moment is is just vague. And and related to where it is described. Okay, currently I think it's a reference in the um, operational guidelines draft. No, it's, it's referenced in the appendix that this refers to. You see appendix at A15 blah, 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 for rationale and oh, okay. a bit higher up. It's, a, you know, and, and it's that, that white paper is summarized in the reference, um, sorry, in the appendix. And it's um, you know, which metrics you have to measure and what the main results are and the weaknesses of it and everything is all in the appendix that this refers to. So it is already in the draft. 
if you want more or less or different, you know, please talk about the text in the draft. I, I might make a suggestion. So if I understand correctly, some of the people uh, in this meeting have been implementing uh, transports for using the L4S service and uh, obviously they must have been doing something in this regard. So it'd be great if we could hear what they're thinking about this and whether the, the white paper reference was uh, okay for them or what was described there was clear enough or what whether the goals of uh, eliminating false positives and false negatives to the greatest extent possible were hard for them what uh, basically what their experience was trying to implement some kind of uh, uh, classic bottleneck detection algorithm can i add that um, something I think would be useful to put in this draft. There's a very short section in the white paper that describes an out of band test. That's very simple to detecting not only whether something is a, um, is a classic, you know, 3168 AQM, but also, um, whether it's, um, in a single queue or, you know, in, in a, in a shared queue or in a, um, multiple queues. And it's just two flows. It's just something, um, that's much more difficult to do passively because you haven't, you've only got one flow that your congestion control is controlling. And that's, that's very reliable. And we, we could put that in this test. And the whole idea is that once you've got a candidate that you think might be a um, classic AQM, you can then just run that test and that's it. And basically there's four states, you know, um, you, you, you look for the delay and the throughput of the two flows and if the delay is greater than one and the throughput is greater than one and so on there's the, the four possible states of the matrix tells you which type of aqm it is i could put that in this draft and then you're done yeah uh, maybe, maybe something to add is that um if you can hear me i believe so yeah so so that uh, quick also allows a lot of possibilities there eh? so it shouldn't be only tcp but in, in quick you can have multiple flows with with different congestion controls and even with different ecn treatments potentially so um, there also different type of traffic can go side by side and and heuristics can be used or or at least uh, detection mechanisms can more easily be implemented Okay, well, I don't see anyone else queuing up to discuss this one. So other than the classic bottleneck detection, are there any other open issues people want to raise with this draft that uh, we should be aware of? VPN reordering issue is going to require more. Is going to require going to require more discussion on, on more more discussion on the list. Uh, it's come up very recently. It's uh, there's been some very long discussions. Uh, it's very very hard to tease very hard to tease out from that what's going on there. Uh, I think there's an actual problem there, but I think I want to take that to list. Suppose to spend the next half hour on it. I, I agree with you, David. There, there is a problem there. It's clear. Okay, Gory is in the queue. Yeah, um, and I um, we, we've been talked about a lot of these things as we talked about L4S uh, topics. Um, on this one, I think we really need to focus in on what L4S does differently, not just the generic problem of internet paths and the reordering thresholds in things like IPsec. Uh, because this is a topic that's going on all over the IETF at the moment. It's not kind of just a transport thing. So I'm just encouraging people to really, really clearly go in on what is the L4S specific problem here that isn't generic in, in other systems that have 
um, reordering issues. Gloria, I agree with you. And uh, my statement was, was that I believe there is an L4S specific problem here. Yeah, let's get to it. Okay, Jonathan, you're next in the queue. Hmm. Okay, um, besides the two things that have already been mentioned, the other thing I wanted to bring up was the success criterion for the experiment. I think the slide said that the main success criterion would be deployment. But I think it's also very necessary to discuss um, uh, the, uh, the safety case for L4S and how that affects how much or how widely it can be deployed on the internet. Uh, for example, whether it satisfies the RFC 4774 option two criterion or whether it remains an option one um, uh, proposal uh, which requires a more stringent containment. I don't think it's too controversial to say that it's not an option three. Um, you're entitled to your opinion. However, the observation from the chair is that whether or not this fits under RFC 4774 option three, which everybody else who's not in the, not uh, been reading, reading it in detail is the can be deployed on the whole internet safely coexist with existing traffic. Um, I think whether or not L4S falls under that is uh, is not settled at this point. It's certainly the case that L4S is originally designed intended to go that route. And there's actually slides in a uh, passenger meeting that say so. Right, but option two is what says that it should detect what sort of path it's running over um, and adapt to that. And that seems to be the, the approach that it's trying to aim for with the detection heuristic, which we don't need to discuss any more today. Um, but that doesn't sound like an option three, which to me sounds more like an inherent coexistence rather than adapting. Uh, if I, now I join the queue, I don't know whether I'm jumping. Sorry. Um, go go just... ahead, Bob, I think. Uh, the only other person in the queue is Gori at the moment. So, well, Gori, was your point in response to that? Or yeah, I'd have you talk first. Go ahead. Okay, I, I was just going to say that um, the the amount of unfairness, to use that quoted word, um, you get still allows you to make progress, and and that's why we've moved to this um, operational um, FRS ops draft approach, where um, the you, you you can allow that um not ideal situation to persist for a short while and then you sort it out maybe on human time scales rather than automatically and um therefore i think you know we're not talking here about something that blocks the internet or you know starves something takes it down to its minimum window they have a balance it's just not a fair balance and and um you know if it and and in particular in situations when you have a um a congested situation meaning that all the flows go um to a low rate it gets closer to one to one um not further away which is important for safety so um you know all these factors have to be taken into account in how you classify what this situation is, but I would, um, I, I'm surprised to hear David saying that, but um, maybe not completely surprised at this stage. Um, I think I have to uh, make a correction here because the problem is that the conventional flows are reduced to their minimum window in many cases, and that is a problem. It all depends how far away from the minimum window the L4S flows are.
because everything will be reduced to its minimum window. Obviously, if you've got a lot of ingestion, it's 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 a question of you know the, the minimum window on its own isn't the test. It's it's how unfair it is when some things are being starved. Which is exactly our point. Right. Okay. And I, I wanted to move to uh, so Gory is in the queue, and then uh, Jake, and then Pete following. I was responding to whether deployment was a criteria uh, for success, and I think in the IETF we defined a number of different experimental RFCs that have seen quite wide deployment, and some that have seen practically no deployment. If we see an uptake of an RFC and we see lots of deployment, then there's going to be extra specs that come along. That's the nature of an experimental RFC. And it might also be that we don't continue with other protocols that conflict with that. I think we just have to decide whether we wish to go forward as a working group and try a new version of ECN. Uh, we've been talking about it for a long time and I'm just applying a little bit of pressure perhaps to people to make that decision because um, there are going to be things that don't work so well perhaps with the new system. There are going to be things that work better and there's going to be things that need to be changed. But at some point we have to decide what we want to do. And deployment is a very good measure of whether an RFC is a useful RFC. I'll leave it there. Great. And Jake? Uh, you're in the queue. All right, thanks. Um, I was uh, asked, I guess, so the uh, section A.1.5, uh, um, the part clarifying the coexistence with classic congestion uh, bit, uh, it talks about this, uh, this concept of um, intervening in administrative time. I think Bob mentioned that. Uh, just recently also. Um, my question is about like, is this intended to capture a notion that, that when a user sort of calls to complain to somebody, that no matter who they call to complain to, like all the plausible candidates that they're going to call uh, are, are going to sort of feed back into a channel that can take action or, um, and, no, no, and if so, no. is that? No, no. Um, sorry, Jake. Can I answer that straight away? Yeah, please. The, 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 the structure of all the all the requirements and the one that was on the screen is that the monitoring must go on all the time. It's not. It's not. Doesn't require a customer to phone. Um, you know, monitoring it. The host must Hold monitor or minute, something guys. must monitor. monitor. Text, text is not on the screen. Can we get back up, please. Yeah. And and then, um, the question of whether you respond to that in real time, which it recommends you do, or um, you, you're allowed to have done pre-validation tests, pre-deployment tests, or whatever, so that you don't have to have your machines always doing all, all the monitoring all the time. Um, that, that was the process that we tried to um, capture in those words with all the possible options of it, which um, maybe would be um, need the L4S ops draft to understand it all, but the L4S draft isn't isn't that different from what it was. So um, it, it's it, the general idea is that it's recommended that you do everything in real time, but, uh, and if you don't, you must still do the monitoring in real time, obviously, because you can't, you can't monitor stuff out of real time. Okay. Um... Okay, so this basically relies on an, uh, essentially the absence of false negatives that you're. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, checking to make sure I understood. Thank you. All right, Pete, and then following Pete, I've got uh, Sebastian, and then uh, Cone. I think we'll cut the line after uh, you. So, Pete, you're up now. Oh, right. Um, just in talking about the interaction between uh, L4S and non-in flows, um, 
The L4S transports, at least Prague and Scream, share the same response to CE marks as DCTCP, or at least that's what it says in L4S ID 4.3. So when we're discussing the interaction with DCTC, or rather L4S and non-L4S flows, whether those flows are short or, or long or the network conditions, what we're really talking about is the same thing as the interaction between DCTCP and conventional TCP, right? I'm just I'm just gonna ask it as a question first and then and see from there. Coon or Bob, would you like to answer that question? What was exactly the question? Sorry, I didn't catch the question. Pete, so, I think you're asking if uh, if the the topic or if the question could be characterized as uh, prog and scream essentially perform like uh, data center TCP uh, in terms of this. Uh, is is that your question? Um, not exactly. I'm talking about the interaction between L4S and non-L4S flows when they meet in a shared 3168 queue, which was starting to be discussed in terms of short and long flows. I'm, I'm just trying to establish when we're talking about those interactions and the sort of harm that we see there. Are we really talking about the same harm that we're seeing between that you can see between DCP and conventional TCP? Ingemar has an answer on screen, so maybe you should jump in, Ingemar. Okay, a short one. As regards to Scream, and one should keep in mind that uh, Scream is fed by uh, in, by data from video encoders, and they are typically have a frame size that, that vary quite a lot. And if you use a Scream with L4S, that will actually uh, accommodate the headroom for those larger frames, which means that the queues will pretty often be empty. So it's not like uh, infinite uh, trans. trans infinite data transmission that you would run, for instance, with DCTCP. So there you have a difference. But I'm going to say I haven't tried it out against uh, uh, normal TCP, but I suspect strongly that the screen will, will, uh, will be the one that suffers the most in that respect. That is, not sure if that is comprehensible, but... Um. Folks, uh, please take a look at the minutes. I'm doing my best to capture this because you go along. And Ingemar, I think I caught your comment, but didn't use your words. So I'll let so it go Pete, for now. Thanks. So, Pete, uh, can I just check? What, were you talking about the protocol, which I think is specified only in the ITF for particular cases, or the congestion control behavior? Were you, which, which part of D, was it the DC TCP congestion control? part or yes. was it the protocol of dctp just, yes, just the congestion it, control. It, it, precisely it was the congestion control response that i'm thinking of yeah okay that helps thanks and and maybe to to add there uh like tcp proc and and congestion control or uh or da data center tcp or it's congestion control at least are only let's say examples um th there are other mechanisms that could fit there, um, maybe not the AIMD or, well, so it's it's not really defined, right? Um, it's a service, and we agree on some rules, and it's the idea to allow multiple congestion controls to fit in that world. Um, the only, let's say, um, um, interface between different flows are their marking rates and the marks that they can use to keep the buffer under control and to share a fair rate. Of course, if it's mixed um, with, I, with classic TCP, it's, a, it's another story. I'm attempting to rephrase Pete's question. Is the experience in what happens when you mix, uh, say, DCTCP with Reno or Cubic flows in a shared 3168 queue applicable to uh, what we can expect to see when we mix L4S and non-L4S uh, flows in a shared 3168Q. Um, so, so, yeah. 
Yeah, Bob, or I, 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 I was, I was going to say, I'm, I'm not really sure why we're, uh, why the question is being asked because it's, it's not intended that DCTCP is used on the public internet, and we've, we've built Prague for that purpose, um, and, and so it has got slightly different behaviours, and those behaviours are diverging all the time. In, for instance, because it's we, the additive increase in particular um, doesn't any more pause for the congestion window reduce period, uh, but it um, it only does an additive increase on every ACK, not every NAC. And so that makes it a lot smoother, um, but that means it's it's altered the um, response when it's in a, in a queue with Cubic. So I, I wouldn't use DCTCP because you've got Prague if, if you wanted to test things, if that's what the question is, but I'm not, I'm not sure why what's behind the question to know how to answer the question really. It seems a bit of a strange question. I'll just, I'll just finish up real quickly, real quickly, just to say that the, the reason for the question is um, we have done testing on short and long flows and, and shown the harm in that. And I posted data earlier today, which if people want to look at those results, we can't, you can, but are we really just testing the interaction between TC TCP and DCTCP, and is it sufficient to just point to the DCTCP draft which says we can't deploy it as enough uh, instead of doing a bunch of tests that show harm between the two different types of flows? That, that's the reason for the question. Right. So, um, that, I mean, I mean, certainly the um, startup behavior and, and such like of TCP Prague is only going to get, um, you know, less well not i won't say less aggressive it's it's not going to cause any more queuing so if, if you're talking about short flows versus long flows i mean typically the the, the problem has been um that um dc tcp was too lame against against classic um congestion controls um but I mean, I, 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 to be honest, that's why I was a bit flummoxed about um, you to asking about short flows because I hadn't seen your your mail this morning about new tests, short flows against long flows. But um, certainly we've done a lot of those, we've done loads and loads of, of tests of that sort of thing. But I'll, I'll have to have a look at your um, test, but I, I'm still not really sure what question is getting at what Okay, I, I think I mean, that's certainly a, don't use DC TCP if you're trying to um, test anything because that's no longer the uh, what, what, what I captured yeah. in the minutes is L first part programs are improved on DC TCP does not do not does not consider DC TCP DC TCP to have civil coexistence question. Um, I sorry, there, there was a few words sort of elided there. Um, does not consider DC TCP what to okay. have settled RS. Oh. Uh, this has settled uh, uh, RFC three one sixty eight coexistence question. Right. Yeah. And and yeah, if you're talking that, about coexistence, that, that, that'll do for now. More discussion to come on. Yes. Yeah. If you're just talking about coexistence, then we're not expecting them. Um, the um, TCP Prague to coexist in a classic queue um, with Cubic, unless um, you're doing these. Um, this testing either live or off out of band and then you you find that you've got a classic queue and then you deal with it um either by turning off your classic aqm or whatever you know the, the, the text that's on the screen at the moment so um yeah i mean if, if if you produce results that say the two don't coexist very well yes we know that um and that's sort of the whole point of the l4s ops thing and the monitoring and all the rest of it yeah, and speaking of that, so I've got uh, Sebastian, it looks like you left the queue. Uh, and so I've got Cone in the queue, and then I'd like to move to Greg's uh, part of the meeting. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say um, about Gori's point um, that um, indeed, if if Alpharis is, is successful, um, and I assume most low latency uh, or applications that uh, want low latency and interactive applications, they will use this L4S um, 
and to get a low latency and also a smoother throughput. So it might not be at the end the service for for quickly grabbing link speed when it's available, and it's also not important for interactive applications to to use this. Uh, this this rate quickly. So if you want to do a download, you you still might want to use the classic uh, case. So assuming that fast downloads will be done with uh, uh, the 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 normal drop non ECT non and uh, low latency services will use uh, the Alvarez ID. Um, I I I. I guess there is not much benefit anymore for ECT0 just over for a download over using ECT0 instead of non ECT. So in the future, hopefully uh, it, it ends up in being a better ECN service um, and a, a new kind of selector for uh, applications to determine whether they prefer low latency over the top speeds or, or following variations. And, and only have a small queue compared to um, downloads, which might uh, want top speed and don't mind of having a very big queue in the network where if uh, capacity becomes available, it quickly can drain that queue uh, and keep that queue full in cases there are variations or even if the throughput goes down, that that queue grows quickly instead of the L4S queue. So, um, I think this is a, indeed a good point and we should look to the future and, and the future evolutions and, and think in terms of in the future, what is then still the importance of ECT0, which I think is minimal and, and hopefully if the experiment goes well, we'll, we'll end up in uh, end systems that have to decide anyway whether they use ECT0 or ECT1 or non-ECT, um, that there is a clear choice for, for both either using uh, ECT1 uh, for low latency or use non-ECT uh, to avoid maybe comp complexities with uh, with old uh, ECN AQMs, which are still there so that they can be decommissioned as soon as possible. But okay, that's that's my view. And I think we should look at to the future and not stop ourselves in, in further evolution. Okay, great. And uh, from what I can tell, so we have some follow ups to do on this uh, draft and I, I guess some of the um, open items we talked about are closely linked to the guidelines. Uh, work that uh, that Greg is going to talk about the status of. So, actually, I'd like to uh, not try to check consensus on the, the, the transport requirements right now. Um, but maybe uh, do that more towards the end since uh, uh, some of people's thoughts on them might be linked towards more discussion we'll have on the operator guidelines. Uh, so if that's okay with everyone, I'm gonna give the ball to Greg. Okay. And you should be the presenter now. All right, let me try to share. All right, hopefully you can all see that. And Greg and Kuhn, please make sure to send slides to us so we can get them posted. Okay, sure, will do. Um, all right, so this is um, just a quick uh, overview of the updates in the L4S Ops draft. Um, I did last week post the first uh, working group version of this. Um, I was the editor of the individual drafts and I continue to be uh, the editor of working group draft um, and again I'm uh, just the editor um, uh, several folks have contributed the text that exists in the draft um, and I certainly do uh, welcome suggestions for additional text if it's needed um, uh, just a quick status um, so there were three in individual drafts um, had been discussed in previous IETF meetings um, and uh, the working group uh, adopted uh, this draft uh, in late March of this year, and then I last week again updated or uploaded the uh, first working group draft version. Uh, can I suggest you zoom your window to full screen? 
WebEx sure. window sharing is particularly poor. It just shows a little window in a sea of white. Right. Basically shares your whole screen, but then crop. That's better, thanks. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, in the draft working group draft 00, zero uh, I did add a few uh, sections of text. There, was, there were some editorial changes throughout um, uh, the document and on the mailing list, I did send a link to the diff, so that's easily available if you want to look at all of the um, all the edits. Um, the major changes were a new section 3.1, which summarizes the recent studies on deployment of RFC 3168 AQMs uh, in the internet. Um, and there are three that are discussed. Um, so uh, Jake's study, which he presented at um, a MAPRG interim last year, um, which indicated a small number of ASNs that had significant deployment of RFC 3168 um, based on the, um, the graph that was shown in that presentation. It was on the order of half a dozen ASNs out of the 100 that were included in the study that had significant deployment of 3168, um, here meaning uh, it was seen on 10% or more of uh, paths. Um, and then there was a long tail, um, and uh, Jake pointed to a global baseline of about 0.3% of paths where uh, it appeared that uh, a 3168 style AQM was present. Um, Difficult to say um, across actually all, all these studies, um, there's no direct uh, detection of Q versus uh, shared Q, um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that I think is the largest study where there's detailed data available. Um, second one is the Apple results from 2018, um, which uh, didn't provide nearly as fine grained uh, results on this specific topic. Um, it covered a number of other uh, pathologies that were seen with Apple's enabling of classic ECN on uh, in iOS and macOS, um, but there was one one slide where they talked about um, uh, incidences of CE marking on paths across the world, um, and three countries were mentioned as having a prevalence that was you know exceeding the global baseline that uh, um, that Akam had shown. So um, no explanation currently on a couple of those with China, 1% uh, of the paths. Um, we don't have, as far as I know, further information on that, nor on Mexico, um, where it was 3.2% of the paths. Um, the third one, though, is France, uh, where 6% or six of the paths sh showed uh, prevalence of uh, CE marking um, by by an AQM, um, that seems to be largely consistent with the uh, comments made on the mailing list about uh, uh, a large ISP in France having implemented FQ Caudal in their DSL um, gateways. Um, so, uh, um, so that was the Apple result. And then lastly, uh, Pete's data from a, a small cooperative ISP in Czech. Um, where a subset of the backhaul links had an FQ caudal implementation that was deployed by that uh, uh, the organizers of that cooperative, uh, and then aside from those backhaul links, there were um, a number of other paths where CE marking was observed, or CE marking or EC, ECE uh, response uh, was seen. Uh, and that corresponded to roughly 10% of the paths that uh, um, that did not have the FQ caudal provided by the ISP itself. Um, so that, that small ISP seems to uh, potentially fall into the category of one of the small number of ASNs that uh, had a significant percentage of paths with uh, um, RFC 3168 deployed. Um, in that case, um, I believe the discussion on the mailing was pointed to the likelihood of that being FQ 
in the majority of those cases, although again, there was no direct evidence of uh, of FQ versus uh, a single Q or, or shared Q. Um, but uh, based on, uh, I think, knowledge of the uh, the ISP and the participants in that cooperative ISP, um, the discussion on the mailing list led us to believe that the dominant deployment there was most likely FQ call. Um, so the new section 3.1, um, after public, uh, publishing this draft 00, Sebastian pointed to another uh, paper, which had some data around CE marking. Um, I responded on the mailing list that I will include a link to that paper or reference that paper in an update of the draft. Although the data that um, was observed there seemed to be more puzzling than enlightening. Um, my recollection is they saw 5% of packets on a, this was a study of a single um, link uh, at Equinix in New York City. Um, uh, and 5% of the packet showed uh, non zero values in the ECN field, but of those 94% of them were CE marking, which does not seem to be indicative of uh, actual classic ECN behavior um, with that high marking probability. Um, all right, so moving on, uh, um, also added a section six um, that talks about actions that can be taken by the by an operator of an FQ bottleneck. Um, it's a relatively short section. It talks about um, ideally um, updating those FQ bottlenecks to be L4S aware uh, would be the first recommendation and then uh, points to some of the same remedies that are available to an operator of a single Q 3168 uh, bottleneck uh, could be useful in the FQ case as well. In particular, treating ECT1 as not ECT, um, tunneling ECT1 through that FQ um, and having the outer header indicate not ECT. Um, and finally, uh, effectively ble mark, uh, bleaching the ECT1 marking to uh, not ECT. Uh, and then, could yeah. I pause you there? I think Jake joined and left the queue, but Sebastian is in the queue. Okay. I think with a comment on the, the prior bullet. Go ahead, Sebastian. Thanks. So uh, in, in that paper that you mentioned, the 5% number truly looks a bit fishy, but they also report 0.3% um, um, ECN bits for port 80 and 443 with believable ratio of ACT0, ACT1, and CE proportions. So I mm. think that supports the number that from um, uh, Jake that you report as Akamai 2020. So, okay. Thanks. All right, so we can uh, work on uh, in what discussion of that paper goes into the, the draft. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I'll take a look at that more closely. Okay, um, and then finally, um, a new section seven was added discussing the conclusion of the L4S experiment, uh, both um, if it's deemed successful and the, the RFCs moved to pro standard status, as well as the uh, potential that is, is concluded uh, as an unsuccessful experiment and we would like to reclaim the ECT1 code point. Um, all right, so, um, this, this is the outline of the document um, uh, and, you know, again, with the new section 3.1, 6 and 7, um, I think some of the important things to point out are this section 4, um, which, which um, is most closely aligned with all the discussion around detection uh, and uh, deployment safety. Um, in terms of what a L4S implementer needs to do. It does um, break out the scenarios a, a bit, um, actually on two dimensions. One dimension is uh, provided in the outline here, whether the server is uh, intended for or is deployed in, in a context where 
it's serving a small number of networks or a small population of, of end hosts, uh, for example, CDN servers or servers operated by an ISP. Um, and then the other category of hosts that are operated um, more generally and are serving content across a wide variety of endpoints and across a wide variety of networks. The other dimension that the section four goes into is what type of um, content effectively the, the host is serving. Is it a general purpose server serving a wide variety of content? Um, for example, a web server, uh, which may be using TCP and or, and or quick and uh, is serving uh, uh, different file sizes um, um, and kind of general purpose uh, content, uh, as opposed to a specialized server that is implemented to serve a particular type of content. So the example that the draft mentions is a, a cloud gaming server that is um, uh, running a real-time video codec and, um, uh, and serving content at um, you know, perhaps long running sessions, but more real time rather than um, file transfer type applications. Yeah. So, um, and there are different um, expectations uh, depending on you know, which of those uh, types of, of hosts uh, we're talking about. The draft does try to put the onus on uh, any kind of 3168 detection and mitigation of any issues that might result on the server as opposed to the the client um, so that um, uh, that um, and th that can be more easily managed than if uh, you know the server clearly is uh, their deploy the operator server is clearly uh, in a better position to understand what uh, types of networks and what type of content is going to be served. So um, that's the outline. Um, in terms of to-dos and discussion, um, there are three to-dos explicitly listed in the document. Um, these were comments that were made on the mailing list, which uh, I've not um, come up with text myself to address, um, and nor has anyone uh, suggested specific text on them. but. Uh, further discussion on the severity and who might be impacted by uh, shared queues that implement classic uh, ECN. Uh, the second one is um, discussion of uh, the risk of incorrectly classifying a path. So, again, what's uh, what is the uh, result of a false positive or false negative in terms of detecting 3168? And then third one. Um, the draft talks about um, potentially, you know, in certain cases, a host um, maintaining a list of paths on which or endpoints on which 3168 was detected, uh, and it was a requested that we add more information on how a host might cache or maintain that list. Uh, I think how how entries might age out that, that kind of thing. Um, and then on the mailing list, um, a couple of other items. Um, again, the discussion of VPNs and the replay attack window implementations. Um, sounds like that's a broader discussion, um, which there may, may be some new aspect related to L4S here, but kind of general issue uh, that arises with, uh, with VPN implementations. And then um, uh, this discussion of remarking ECT1 to not ECT um, that is listed in the draft as a uh, kind of a last resort, um, bleaching ECT1 to not ECT, and that does uh, violate one of the requirements in the ECNL for SID draft. And so we either need to um, agree that that violation of that requirement is acceptable as a last resort or eliminate that as a potential remedy. So that's what I've got for slides. David's in the queue, so let's like let him go. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And I figured I'd queue myself as an individual here. Um, don't see a mention of marking uh, DSCPs on L4S traffic to increase uh, operator ability to deal uh, 
to deal with it. Um, this draft seems like the right place, the right, the right place, to, right place to have that discussion. Yep, that's a good point. That, sh that should be uh, listed as further discussion. Um, um, and, and yeah, we we can certainly add um, that as an option um, if there's a general view is that is a worthwhile um, mechanism that that can be used by an operator. Um, I guess I'd welcome suggestions on crafting text that would describe in what situations that's useful. Um, it was unclear to me in the mailing list uh, discussion um, whether that required endpoints to do some specific implementations in order to support it or not, um, if it's um, relying on you know, network boundaries to look for a particular DSCP and um, if it's present, bleach ECT1 to not ECT, and if it's not present, don't. Um, there are a number of options there. It'd be nice to be and clear about what we think is a worthwhile usage of DSCP in this context. Yeah, I, okay. I think that I, I think for the special list makes sense. I will um, I will make a note to myself to send a send a note send a note to the list about what it would mean just as a network mechanism without endpoint particular without uh, endpoints actually getting involved in. Uh, in reacting to uh, to uh, to receive DSCPs. Okay. And Stuart, you're in the queue. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, I used to be an engineer. Now my uh, days are full of meetings. I feel like a manager. So I apologize that I've not tracked all the work as closely as I would have liked. Um, my goal is I'm trying to get low latency internet deployed. In my life, I've seen throughput go from 300 board dial-up modems to kilobits, to megabits, to gigabits, but round trips times are still stuck at about half a second or worse. And I'd like to see us fix that before I die. Um, RFC 3168 was published 20 years ago, and it's still not widely deployed. So some observations I've made is that um, even with some kind of FQ statistically putting flows into hash buckets, queues will be shared between different flows. And uh, the, the super low latency flows want to be protected from other flows sharing the queue. And that implies we need some kind of input queue selector, uh, like L4S with ECT0 versus ECT1. We also have the consideration, because I work for Apple and we make end systems, the end systems want the lowest delay they can. And that means if the bottleneck link is L4S or similar, whatever this new better thing is, whatever we call it in the end, uh, if that super low latency queuing is available, we want to make use of it. But if the bottleneck is classic ECM, we don't want to give that up. Um, so we we want to get uh, the benefit of whatever is available in the bottleneck link. Uh, in private conversations with colleagues, I've heard talk about using DSCP code points instead of uh, the ECN bits as that queue selector. And I joined this meeting today, hoping to hear more discussion of that. And um, turns out I was a mistake, and that was not the focus of this agenda. Uh, but uh, that is something that I think we will have to pursue. I know uh, DCP code points are defined as per hot behaviors, not end to end behaviors. Uh, but Maybe if we decide that's not right, that's something we can change. Um, so that's my uh, my plea is let's get this done before we're all dead. And my uh, slightly more focused question is uh, maybe we should pursue 
DSCP marking so that an endpoint can indicate I support classic ECN and I also support this new thing. So give me what you've got. Stuart, up front. Stuart up. this is David. I have promised to 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 uh, swing swing the swing the baseball bat at the yellow jacket nest labeled DSCP marking. I will do that on the list. Uh, uh, I suggest you get your Kevlar armor out of storage. It's going to be interesting. Um, yes, uh, fully appreciate this is not easy. I just, I'm really depressed that we're stuck in such a log jam. Um, uh, everybody on this call shares the same high level goal, which is lower latency for, uh, flows on the internet. Uh, one comment I'll make people, uh, it's very, very common for people to think that some traffic wants throughput and some traffic wants low delay. Like that's an either or choice. And the classic example of I don't care about delay is downloads. And if you're downloading the latest OS update to your device overnight, it's true. You don't really care about round trip delay on the left network as long as the update is done in the morning. Uh, but there are many other things which we think of as bulk transfer, but low latency still matters. And one example I'll give is video streaming. Uh, I can sit and watch a two hour Netflix video from start to end and it works fine today. That's a problem we've solved. But if I get bored and decide to skip ahead to chapter seven, then suddenly on that TCP flow, the video streaming client has got to abandon the media segments it was requesting and request a different segment. So even things that we think of as being bulk transfer also benefit from better agility uh, given through lower network delays. So I actually think most traffic on the internet benefits from lower delay. It's a very rare subset where delay makes no difference. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I think that um, in my general observation of the situation we're in is that um, we're talking about um, coexistence in uh, a fairly small percentage of flows that uh, or situations in which um, uh, there are issues with uh, coexistence with classic ECN and in this very small um, proportion of links that, that have implemented a shared queue with Classic ECN, um, and um, essentially all of those are um, solvable, uh, you know, fixable situations, right? All, all those Classic ECN implementations can eventually get replaced with L4S aware implementations, um, and and we should keep that in mind that that our goal is at least. I think um, a common goal is to improve the latency performance of the internet and um, maintaining um, pure 3168 deployments um, you know, as they are uh, today um, is not, it shouldn't be a strong goal. I think a goal should be that we're improving all of the paths or as many as possible. And granted, that will take time, but. Uh, that we're getting the benefit um, of L4S across the vast majority of paths uh, very early on, and then um, you know fixing uh, older implementations so that they work better with uh, coexistence with classic ECN um, uh, over time. I, I think we can't dismiss classic ECN. It's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, uh, in my position at Apple, we've been having lots of meetings with vendors about their plans because we are really working hard to push this work forward. And there are a number of products on the market already that are implementing FQ Coddle doing the classic ECN marking. We know other vendors who've got products in the pipeline. And these products, once deployed, are not going to go away for a decade. Uh, I'll give one example from my personal experience. My home internet connection is cable modem. And 
uh, most of the time, the download bottleneck is at the CMTS. So the queuing at that uh, CMTS is what dictates my delay. And uh, if Cable Labs is successful, that will be upgraded to something better soon. But that connects to a separate Wi-Fi access point. And as long as I'm close to it, it gets hundreds of megabits per second and the CMTS remains the bottleneck. But if I take my phone into the kitchen with me and I'm further from the access point, the rate of the Wi-Fi rate drops and then the access point becomes the bottleneck. And that access point is running FQ Coddle, it's doing classic ECN marking, and I don't hold out any hope that the vendor of that low cost access point is going to ship me a firmware update. So I'm in a situation where sometimes my queue is the CMTS, sometimes my bottleneck queue is the Wi Fi access point, depending on where I'm standing in the house. So I think we're going to see a world for the next decade where we have to assume that classic ECN coexists with L4S. All right, Spencer, you're next in the queue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I am starting by saying that I agree with what Stuart has been saying, and the longer he talks, I, the more I agree with him. Um, but I wanted to mention one other thing here that, uh, so I've been working on a couple of drafts about uh, multipath in Quick in the Quick Working Group, um, and two things that have come up there uh, basically, uh, and this is well a big thing that I've come up with uh, that there that uh, I, makes me agree with Stuart is basically the more I push at people's you know what they want for their applications, nobody really wants or is happy about high latency. So if, you know, so the, the it seems like to me that uh, Stuart's thing about uh, relying on being, you know, being able to have some of the packets go to the left and some of them go to the right, because some of the packets going to the left don't care, you know, the senders don't care. I, I think that that's something we really need to think seriously about. Uh, like Stuart, I have not watched this group uh, this work as closely as I did when I was the area director, but uh, I'm very pleased to see the discussion about things like uh, possible DS uh, DSCP guards and things like that that might uh, be able to uh, make it move uh, faster and be more realistic uh, in whatever deployments look like. So uh, I, I, I do want to give the working group uh, kudos for continuing to come up with good ideas, uh, even though I know this has been difficult. Thank you. All right, Jake, you are next in line. All right, uh, I came into the queue when Greg mentioned small, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the scope of of breakage, I guess, um, or the uh, of, of difficulties. I forget the exact phrasing, but the uh, the point I wanted to make is that zero point three percent might sound pretty small, but with four point five billion internet users, that that means some you know thirteen and a half uh, million end users that are potentially affected here. And and I think there's a a good and legitimate question of like. How many broken flows are we talking about, and how bad are they broken with the coexistence questions? And uh, um, so, to this end, um, I did put a recent email a couple days ago out about uh, the plausibility of a flag day, in which there's one point I want to highlight here in this context, which is uh, that I think it's a really useful thing to talk about our breakage budget. How many flows? How what the user experience is, at you know, and and sort of what's going to be okay? Because to Stuart's point, um, you know, we're going to be stuck with some uh, thirty one sixty eight queues for a long time, but if we do have a credible plan for kind of um, uh, for making the world safe for coexistence by uh, deprecating. Uh, the old ECT1 behavior, um, you know, then like at what 
sort of level would we be willing to push that forward and to induce some level of breakage, but satisfy ourselves that it's within sort of a, a manageable scope. Um, so I, I would encourage further discussion on that point. I, I thought Bob's response was promising to that uh, as well as, as the others that have responded so far, but um, I just uh, let's, we'll have to take that to the list obviously, but uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and again, I'd point out that the other aspect of that is um, what is the timeline for remedying um, those situations where um, there is some you know, quote breakage. Um, you know, you you'd pointed to a fairly small number of ASNs where clearly the ISP or um, presumably the ISP was deploying the thirty one sixty eight bottleneck. Um, so that's a small number of um, of people that need to be made aware of um, the, the redefinition of ECT one and CE. Um, and yeah, so maybe a, a large swath of uh, those situations can either be um, remedied by not deploying L4S on those networks um, and or getting uh, those networks upgraded to um, to L4S awareness. Um, and then the, on the 0.3% uh, baseline, um, you know, moving as quickly as we can to um, implementations that um, can continue to support 3168 if that's of interest, but um, do so in an uh, L4S aware way so that we don't have um, uh, the coexistence issue. All right, I see uh, four people in the queue and I'd like to use the last five minutes to uh, see if we're getting close to consensus on uh, this draft's uh, aim. So um, I'd like to Keep have people keep that in mind when they comment. So, Bob, uh, you are next in the queue. Yep. Um, yeah, I wanted to pick up on um, that point that Jake was making, which was why I originally came to the queue, even though um, Jake hadn't talked about it then. Um, in in that, there's been a lot of talk about thirty one sixty eight, and um, everyone is sort of not really distinguishing that between. Um, multiple flows in a 30 on 68 queue and not um, multiple flows, you know, single flows in those queues. And something that came up in Jake's um, conversation that I thought maybe was a, a big difference between us and maybe the working group should focus on is um, there seems to have been a presumption that any mixing of queues, you'd say to hash collision in a 30 on 68 queue in, in an FQ, is problematic and and this comes to the point Pete Heist made about short flows and what is a short flow um, because the, the point I made is that unless you, you you've got time to allow the flows to converge if there's a little bit of impact as the as the flows happen to coincide in a queue but they're you know um, one meg flow lasting for less than a second or whatever it doesn't it, it, you can't really um, worry too much about the fairness. It's only that you, when you get to the much longer flows where humans can actually tell the difference, um, that, that you really need to be worried. And so I was, I was very concerned at the calculations Jake had done as, uh, you know, the sort of back of, back, back of envelope numbers as to how likely it was that these things are going to appear in a queue, which looked to me more like, um, birthday paradox type numbers as though there were large numbers of flows um, possibly colliding when you need to, first of all, worry about how many long flows ever collide, even if they were in a FIFO, you know, how many of them collide in time, if you like, before you know whether they might collide in the hash. So I think that's an area where the working group needs to focus on. And, and um, that would also be a focus of this draft, because if, if, we haven't really got a problem in FQ systems apart from the VPN one, and we have anyway got a solution for um, modifying those um, FQ systems to um, separate out ECT1 and ECT0. Obviously, um, you know, they'd have to sort, uh, they'd have to be modified. But if we're talking about modifying them anyway to change their ECT1 behavior to not ECT, why not change it to um, to 
61 to do the LPRS thing, which is really simple in a, an FQ coddle or, or a cake system uh, and is already in the code apart from just a classifier. So, um, you know, that, that I think would massively cover a huge area of what people seem to think is a problem. And I, I didn't realize that maybe um, they were thinking this was a problem because they were imagining there were all these flows coincident with each other, which may not be the case. And so we need to focus on on characterizing that problem. And and I, I know we've only got five minutes. I just wanted to um, quickly respond to, or, or give some tutorial, if you like, to Stuart and um, Spencer about the DSCP thing. Um, so it's it's not as a classifier, Stuart, um, that's not what's being proposed. I, I mean, it could be as well, but it, it, this, this idea of a guard DSCP is, is um, not as the classifier. It's as something that sort of walks along beside the packet, if you like, to, to tell you whether, uh, which, which domain it went into. And um, it's also related to the question of whether the receiver has to tell the sender what it got. And I think that's a non-starter if um, it does. And I'm hoping to see that from David afterwards. Yeah, I will, I will sort those two apart. Use of the classifier could be a really long discussion. I think we need, I think we may need to have it though. Well, no, I'm just, I, I don't think we've got a problem with needing a classifier. We've got a classifier. What we haven't got is um, separation of the two ambiguous meanings of CU. You're starting down the slippery slope, Bob. I'm sure. I'm sure you're aware of that. All right, Cone, you're next in the queue. Yeah. Um, I uh, I also wanted to respond to to Stewart's remarks. Um, so so f f so if if there is currently a push for ECT zero deployment, I hope um, the ECT one. Is kind of covered in 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 a way so that you're also putting the requirement of at least not marking these uh, ECT one packets as if they were, are ECT zero, and and potentially and hopefully also thinking um, future safe to to mark them in a squared way or to support uh, an L4S in some way mechanism. Um, and a second, a second topic is the, the question um, in the future, if you build your applications, what will be your criteria to um, use ECT1 or ECT0 or non-ECT? Um, I, I guess it's from an applications point of view, and if there is a mixture of, of um, deployments, uh, your low latency traffic will clearly use L4S. And, and probably, um, if it's if latency is not uh, the the problem, you will use either ECT zero or or, or drop. So so there, um, maybe also thinking what is the value of ECT zero in the future uh, is something that should be considered. And then and then from from DiffSurf, I I agree with Bob that, and as far as I've seen all the discussions. There is no bulletproof solution, even for a guard, because if a network lets through DiffSurf and there is ECT0 or ECT1 marks there, and there is a classic ECN, uh, nothing is stopping that classic single QE uh, AQM from marking those ECT1s, even if there is a DiffSurf code point on it, marking them with CE in, in the same queue as, as there is ECT0. So I don't see Directly, uh, I haven't seen a solution for that problem. Uh, of all. So, so even guarding, unless we find a very exotic diff surf code point, which is nowhere supported and certainly needs to support it everywhere uh, to, to get end-to-end -end service. Uh, that's a little bit where, where I see most of the things get stuck. Um, I don't know, Stuart, if you want to reply. Well, uh, the, the thing that concerns me is looking at this from the perspective of an application developer or an end system developer. If ECT1 is treated in the network as not ECT, then 
on a path that doesn't have any L4S, if I mark my packets as ECT1, then I lose the ECN benefit. And I want ECN and smart queuing for lower delay because I'm happy with classic ECN. I would like the even lower latency stuff better, but I don't want to make a bid in the network saying, please give me L4S and then find that's not on the path. And the bottleneck was actually classic ECN. And then I gave up that. So as an end system developer, I think my first priority is I set ECT zero to get ECN marking when the bottleneck supports that. If I can additionally put an extra mark on the packet that says, but I also support L4S, if you can do that, then that gives me the opportunity of a bonus of even lower latency. But I don't want to give up the first one in the hope of getting the second one. And that leads me to just jump in and quickly say, yes, that, I, I totally agree. And that's what, that's what we're aiming for. Um, and that, okay. ha have a look at the plausible flag day or whatever thread um, that's in there. Great. I'd like to give Jonathan time to say something brief before we uh, try to check consensus. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I just like to mention that the existing technology of FQ Codel, I believe that's ROC 8290, uh, already provides a combination of um, low latency and reasonably high throughput. Um, in a in a way that's already being deployed, and this can be applied both at the last mile and at the Wi-Fi access point, which are usually for consumers the most significant bottlenecks. So I would say that we should be thinking about whether any improvement that L4S gives over that is worth the pain. I'd just say mobile phones. Lots of people have them. Okay, thanks. And um, Greg, I'm going to steal the presentation window sure. for you. Uh, so I would like to get a sense from the group. Uh, using the uh, WebEx chat, if you could, uh, I'd like to ask the question, um, does the group agree that with these operator guidelines available, that L4S will be suitable for experimentation in parts of the internet? So I think this is um, actually quite close to what uh, Martin just sent to the uh, TSVWG mailing list. Uh, saying like, I think we're getting a sense of the understanding of classic bottleneck deployment, a sense of the possible uh, conditions where there's uh, maybe an issue uh, that, that could arise. And uh, we also have a, a list of uh, things that can be done to help mitigate that. And we know how uh, difficult some of them are, how effective they are. So, uh, I want to get a sense from the group of uh, whether this is essentially converging to something that's going to uh, be publishable and make L4S uh, suitable for experimentation in parts of the internet. So if if you would, I would like people to type either uh, support or not support into the WebEx uh, chat so we could get a sense. Normally we'd hum, <laughs> but humming isn't. Uh, isn't available for us on last do, do, do me a favor is the frantic taker of minutes paste the question and what the responses mean into webex chat which can copy them into the minutes and then summarize the responses so that we know uh we we, we know what the question uh was that people thought they were responding to absolutely well as for i have a question from java which you may or may not wish to take, which is what does parts of the internet mean? <laughs> not right now, we're not taking that one. <laughs> so just a, a friendly uh, reminder, there is a raise hands tool here, which um, 
might work better. Uh, I, I know it exists in the app. I'm not sure if it exists mm -hmm. in the browser. I don't see it. Well, there. So in the app, there's a there's a little emoji plus reactions button kind of next to share, and um, you can have an emoji, but you can also raise your hand, which would then show up in a participants window. Um, I don't know if somebody with a browser can um, verify that, that exists in some way in, in the browser. In the browser, it's between, between, between the, the emotion. emotion. Um, and, uh, I, and I do I do see it, but it's not at all intuitive. Now, so I guess we now at least identify that it exists, and yes, I agree, it's it's horribly intuitive, but but it's there, and that might work better than than trying to use a chat window to, to uh, count number, count heads, because you can then uh, you can then sort the participants list by raised hands, and so it should be relatively easy to count them. Yeah, let's try that. See if it. Works. Okay, I see some responses rolling in. I guess the problem is you don't know whether people are not raising their hand or deliberately lowering their hand, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Well, after we've done this, everybody lower their hands and we'll do a separate question for who believes we're not ready. Yeah, I mean, I see. So we have 30, 34 participants and I see maybe a dozen or so raised hands. It's hard to count quickly. So, so to be clear, these raised hands are agreeing with the statement on the screen. And we'll have a later thing for people who disagree. Yes? Yes. And uh, in addition, I think I see some people have typed support that haven't figured out how to raise their hand. So this is probably a little bit of a mixture. Can you try the inverse words and see how many people do not agree with this? Okay, so let's put our hands down then. I'll wait for all the hands to be down. For completeness, we should say, yeah, okay. Uh, we, we we definitely need to call those who don't agree with the statement. I put right. about I the minutes say about a dozen raised hands. I'm not, I hesitate to put an exact number plus the yeah, I people think in the in, in in a chat. Um, that'll do for now. Yeah, and now okay, please only raise your hand if you disagree with the statement uh, shared. And I know I saw several in the uh, chat already. I see about five popped up very quickly. I'll wait a couple more seconds. And if there are any more, uh, please not support it in the chat and we'll reconcile these things. Okay, well that, that's uh, half a dozen in the hand raising. And I th think those are, maybe there's one more in the chat if I uh, read it correctly. So, okay, I think that's, that's good. All right, well, I don't have, uh, I think that was, that was a real thing I wanted to accomplish uh, this meeting. David or Gory, do you have anything else you want to do before we close? From my perspective, um, it's useful just to tell the list that the the chairs went through the document uh, and looked for textual things that would also come in, uh, to us, and maybe would stumble. We'd stumble on later in the process. So we've also sent in 
um, a set of comments which we pasted to the list. Uh, and hopefully the authors will be able to address uh, many of these in some way um, so that um, as we get on with the process, there's something that we can all um, clearly understand and be clear about. Um, so we, we've been doing that in the background and now it's public and hopefully the new ID will see that. All right, very good. And Bob, you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, and as the editor that's got to cope with all that, um, how would you like, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've written responses to most of them, but I haven't posted them on the list just because of the amount of list traffic at the moment. I wanted to focus on um, the, the particularly the normative text. So, so, and um, do you want us just to, uh, I, I wanted to try and composite some together that seem to be related and respond to those and maybe put the, the, the number of them in the subject line, is that? How we're going to deal with this in terms of email threading? Yeah, I mean, it's such it, a huge list. Yeah, it, it's a huge list of mostly um, editorial stuff that kind of depends on one another. Um, yeah, I think use the numbers and let's not abuse the list with lots of discussion about things. Um, but let, let's post the summary outcome there. If you want to discuss a couple of times through with us to avoid lots of list discussion that's fine but then we'll post the final thing to the list well or, or the other way might be i don't want to stop people discussing on the list you know the, nope. the, to start another thread rather than trying to do it in the in the in this massive long list thread you know which, I really which don't... has all, all sorts of different subjects in it otherwise and you won't be able yeah. to keep track of what's going on i really don't mind how it's done as long as we end up with a document at the end that people can actually go through line by line in the working group last call and say they agree or disagree with because um our our comments are mainly to try and make it clear what it is that the document's claiming so right. i i don't okay. think um you have to do blow by blow accounts but you can do it depends on how you want to use the bandwidth of the mailing list right okay yeah, I, I, I would encourage people certainly not to um, start long conversations in the same thread as the huge list. You know, just start <laughs> another thread. That'd be good. All right, well, I'm going to stop the WebEx recording. And if there's nothing else, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. That's all.